What's fact and what's fiction? A leading CLL expert will tackle common questions and misconceptions so you can make sound decisions about your care. Fact or fiction? CLL, brought to you by the Patient Empowerment Network. Welcome to Fact or Fiction, CLL treatment and side effects. First, let's thank our partner, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Today, we'll debunk common misconceptions about CLL treatments and side effects. That's chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I'm Patricia Murphy, your host for today's program. Joining me is Dr. Javier Punia. Thank you, Dr. Punia, for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How are you doing, Patricia? So I'm a hematology oncologist. I'm the head of the lymphoma program at the Aisley Murphy Cancer Center. Um, in my practice, in my clinic, I see mostly, uh, most 80%, 90% of patients with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. A note before we get started. This program is not a substitute for medical advice, so please refer to your healthcare team with questions. Dr. Pania, can you give us a brief overview of how CLL is currently treated? What are the options? Well, um, right now, most of the time, uh, in fact, it's the most common scenario that we encounter in a weekly basis. Patients get diagnosed with leukemia. That is really, really a bad word for most of the patients. And uh, they really come to our clinics are very, very, um, you know, uh, scared and anxious about the diagnosis. However, uh, we don't really treat most of them. Almost 70% of the patients don't require therapy to start with, right? So... As you may know, and many, many people who really are gonna watch this, uh, this program will know that we really do active surveillance or watchful waiting for many, many months, sometimes year, until there is a specific criteria that patients need to really accomplish to really start therapy. What are those? Well, developing anemia, low platelets, large lymph nodes that really reproduce some symptoms, B cell symptoms like a you know, um, nice sweats, drenching nice sweats, uh, fevers, uh, weight loss, uh, lack of appetite and fatigue and so on, right? So there is no doubt that is reason why we need to treat. Regarding the treatment of uh, this condition, well, uh, we have been lucky because in the last, let's say, seven, eight years, there has been a plethora and really, really a large and new advances in the therapy for this condition. We went from a very old chemotherapy strategies in the oral form or even in the intravenous form, chlorambucil, a very old drug, more than 50 years in the ways, uh, fludarabine, cytoxan, even bendamastin. These, these last three we're using in combination with what we call immunotherapy. So chemoimmunotherapy was very, very popular, let's say 10 years ago, after the chlorambucil went away as really not very optimal therapy. So the, the main standard of therapy for CLL for many years has been combination of chemo and immunotherapy with really relatively good results. However, patients, unfortunately, in many situations will really relapse. So we always talk to the patient that when the times of therapy comes, we're going to really put the patient in remission in many cases. In some cases, it's not really a full remission, it's a partial remission. But this most of the time happens for a certain period of time upon after the patient will require a new therapy. That was kind of the, the, the dilemma and the things that we had been really experiencing for years. However, the introduction of uh, target therapies that was really a revolution in CLL has happened in many other cancers, including other leukemias, like a chronic myeloleukemia. And these new drugs really came to really change the paradigm, to really fix the duration of uh, chemo, immunotherapy, to really taking pills, who can really get patient in remission, or at least in a very good control of the disease for longer period of time, as soon as the patient continue to take the drug. Obviously, we're talking about BTK inhibitors that really, really extremely popular and truly today standard of care for any patient who has newly diagnosed CML who requires therapy in any form, high risk, low risk, older, younger, with comorbid condition, without. This is very well reflected in NCCN guidelines. We really put category one, in this case, to the most common BTK is irutinib, right? So we know that. We know that and we really uh, see patients who really enjoy these drugs for a long period of time. However, obviously, uh, these always come with, with another, uh, you know, issues like uh, intolerance. 
and in some other cases progression, right? So it's BTK mutation has been described and it's been seen in high risk patients. So this has been the standard and really we enjoy this, but we have a very recent, last May, a new drug approved, I was already approved for patients who really fail other therapies, but now also we have availability to really get this drug as an initial therapy. This therapy in this case is called a BCL2 inhibitor. The name is Vinitoclax in combination with another immunotherapy I mentioned before that was classically used with chemo. In this case, Vinitoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, is combined with ovinutuzumab, a drug who is a very powerful anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. What, what really has brought this, this uh, new strategy? Well, it's coming back that the paradigm, as mentioned before, changed from fixed duration with chemoimmunotherapy to long-term durability for pills. But now we have also the opportunity to discuss with patients the possibility to really offer them in certain conditions, not for everyone. Again, we need to really understand that we need to customize the therapy for patients, right? But yeah. this new combination really, really will allow us to many patients who don't want to stay in therapy for life, so we can really offer back time-limited therapy with substituting the old chemotherapy by this drug called BCL2 inhibitor, Vinitoclax, that work very similar to chemotherapy, and they are extremely effective you know, cleaning or at least uh, reducing and sometimes uh, completely um, eradicating uh, most of the CLL cells in the bone marrow of patients with CLL. However, we still now have longer follow-up in the front line. We have a longer follow-up in the second line when patient has failed, um, you know, chemos or other drugs with this co uh, combination with Vinitoclax. In the front line, the data are very, very, um, very, very good but the, 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 there's relatively short follow-up. So patients uh, receive therapy for a year and they stop. So now we are following those patients. The, the, there was a recent publication in the New England Journal who really described this population, this trial called CLL14. But definitely we need to really continue to see how this, this data evolves. As we have seen with ibrutinib for many years, we have already seven years follow-up on ibrutinib and it's something that, that keep going and, and this is what is going to help us to understand who and, and what can really be given these this kind of therapies, okay? It sounds like we've made tremendous progress with CLL. What kind of clinical trials should patients be investigating? What are they, what's, what's out there? Well, there, there is no doubt that um, a lot of people until now were really looking for Vinitoclax frontline clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Now it's available in, in the clinical practice. However, we still try to figure out combination of, of drugs, right? For example, in this case, I just mentioned, we have a very good drug like ibrutinib in frontline. We have other um, BTK inhibitors that are coming up, such as acalabrutinib. We have other PI3K inhibitors that have been not very successful in frontline, right in second line, like uh, idelalisib, dubelisib, even umbralisib, and other drugs like azanabrutinib. So we have a plethora of drugs who are really available as clinical trial outside the ones who have approved. However, one of the things that we are really start to explore in the recent year is how we combine all these mechanisms of action. The most typical combination that we are really now under trial is the combination of two or three drugs as happened in many other forms of cancer. So this combination of these three or some of two or three of these drugs is very, very well studied now in an intergroup trial, the ECOG, the Alliance trial. We're gonna to start to see those trials and I, of course, our patient in frontline will have the opportunity. Besides that, we're gonna see more and more trials who are going to combine patients who are already in chronic therapy with ibrutinib with a second drug with a goal to, in the future, be able to discontinue therapy because it's one of the issues that ibrutinib has these days. Patient takes the drug for, for life. What are the things that you're thinking about when you're considering treatment for your patients, when you're making those decisions? Well, I, I think it's important to really notice and to really um, understand my patient is that we, we need to provide education. We need to provide education and obviously every many, many patients ask me, doctor, what, what I should do, right? But, but I think it's very important for me to understand what is the goals of every patient, right? Age, comorbid condition, um, 
way of life. People like to travel versus you know, stay in the same place. But try to really educate about the options because we are very lucky that we have multiple options. We also understand, so what, what is going to be the difficulties to really get therapy A versus therapy B and how much control or monitoring they require. And finally, also, as mentioned before, to try to customize uh, therapies for different patients. I always say that we discussed in the beginning that not everyone with CLL required therapy at the beginning. However, when the people require therapy, not everyone requires therapy for the same reason. Some people may require therapy because they are anemic, very extremely anemia. Why? Because the bone marrow cannot really produce enough red cells or even platelets. Why? Because there is full of CLL cells. So those patients, in my opinion, they can really do very well with a strategy as BCL2 inhibitor in combination of alone. Why? Because these drugs is able to truly and very, very efficaciously really eliminate the CLL. So we're going to another scenario, patient with very high bulky lymphadenopathy in the neck, axillary and abdominal, for example, with large spleen, who may have very, very severe B cell symptoms. We know that, that we can apply anything, but there's no doubt that um, you know, introduction of a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor or even is extremely successful in reducing the symptomatology very fast and shrinking the lymph nodes in a very short period of time. So again, I wouldn't say that it's black and blue or like a black and, uh, you know, uh, white and, uh, you know, different. Black right? and white. <laughs> black and white. Thank you. Thank you. You got me. So, but, but the true is, is different patients may require different strategies and obviously patients' preference are really, really important. Patients sure. may not like to be in therapy for life. May patient may may don't care. Um, patient may really 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 uh, want specifically shorter therapy. So I think we need to really understand that, give the options, and start to work with them. Also, depending on the presentation and the needs for therapy. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about molecular testing uh, for a moment. What can you learn from molecular testing? Molecular testing is, is, is quite, quite important. Uh, I think uh, there is different tests that we really perform, right? NCCN guidelines, IWCLL has really, really lay out the, the fundamental test that we need to provide. Or we need to really do at least, I say at least, when the patient requires therapy. Why? Because obviously there is going to be an, an important part of uh, how we are going to uh, see the patient and how the patient is going to behave even during therapy. So we are discussing about, obviously, a fish test. Fish test is, is a chromosome analysis that is very, very classical and, and it's been done for years for the four classical chromosomal abnormalities, 11Q, 17P, that is the bad, always we think it's the bad one. It's true that it may even with the new therapies has shorter period of responses. 13Q trisomy 12. So we, we set up with this one. Beside that, what is another important thing? The mutation status of the heavy chains immunoglobulin, the IGHB mutation status. Very, very important because even with the new therapies made no difference, but we now patient with unmuted immunoglobulin may really have different outcomes in the long run. The truth is that with ibrutinib, for example, or vinitoclax, that you don't, we don't see the difference in outcomes but still we need to see what's happening in the long run. So the good news is that with the new therapies, we don't see difference as we used to see with chemotherapy, that unmutated immunoglobulin patients, they may really fail more often than mutated ones. However, I think it's something uh, important that we need to implement. Last but not least is the TP53 mutations. I think it's something that it should be implemented. And I think the, the teaching point is that TP53 mutations maybe also NOJ1 or uh, SF3V1, other mutations that may really give to patients a bad outcomes in the long run, at least with the chemoimmunotherapy, is something that also can be done or at least is something uh, that will be important to, to really um, um, incorporate to, to our patients. Not all the cases, but the some TP53 for sure. Let's play a little fact or fiction game. I'll tell you some of the things we've heard from patients with CLL, sure. and you can tell me if it's fact or fiction. Sure, absolutely. Here we go. First one, and I think we've already solved this, but I'll just say it's a concern of patients. You have to treat CLL right away. 
Uh, that, that's not true, as I mentioned before, and I tell you, most of the patients who really come very scary to our clinics and with a very high anxiety levels do not require therapy. So I think it's important. So it's very specific reason. So most of the people, and many people think that because the white blood counts continue to raise, this is a criteria for therapy. Well, it's a very specific reason of so doubling time, but, but really, really relatively rare. So it's relatively rare to really uh, need therapy for counts or high counts. And most of the people who have uh, high blood counts, they don't feel it. Besides that, I think the, the emphasis is that you patient need therapy when they need therapy, right? But it's not really good to anticipate that. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. Watch and wait can go on for years, and I may never need treatment. You're yeah, right. So there is a special uh, population of patients, mainly with certain characteristics, such as, for example, 13Q by fish, 13Q deletion by fish, and IGBH mutated and uh, um, uh, heavy chains immunoglobulin. Those, those group of patients, that is the classical ones that not all of them, but a group of them may never require therapy. And there is patients in my practice that have been followed for years and years, 10, 15, or even 20. Fantastic. That's very interesting. How about this one? Uh, chemotherapy is the only available approach, one size fits all when it comes to treatment options. Well, as I mentioned before, at length is not really a chemotherapy. I won't say that chemotherapy is not an option these days, but however, with the introduction of the new therapies, I think it's moving away. It's moving away to the, to the therapy for CLL patients, right? And I think I have to admit that we really, with the incorporation of these time-limited therapies I discussed before, the uh, chemoimmunotherapy is using less and less. In the community, maybe, because the incorporation of the new drugs it takes longer, it still may be used, and it may be used, but definitely in academic institution, I can tell you for sure, chemoimmunotherapy is almost gone. That's a great point about community care. That's a great point. So as a patient, I may uh, be able to look into more therapies if I ask my doctor, perhaps? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think uh, many doctors in the community and academic institution, they know that, but obviously, I, I think... Patients with CLL need to understand that it's multiple options today, right? And I don't think, as you say, that chemoimmunotherapy is the only option. It's not really the right answer for, for our patient, right? There is no doubt that it's an option, but there's many others that need to be discussed with our patient to see how we're going to fit those, those different therapies for a specific patient. As I mentioned, try to customize or try to really adapt the different therapies to the goals and, and really, really outcomes for each individual patient. I think we tackled this one a bit, but it's probably worth mentioning again. How about this one? I have to take inhibitor therapies forever. Forever. That, that, that's right. BTK inhibitor, I mentioned before, and mostly all the BTK inhibitors, even the PA3K gamma inhibitors that they are approved in second line now, they are being described or there have been a study that they are being taken until disease progression or an acceptable toxicity, right? So that's the reason. So many patients say, well, I'm remission, can I stop therapy? Well, we do not recommend that because the data that we have from the clinical trials, patients continue therapy. And we know as far as the patient continues therapy, patients are gonna do well. So the question is, what's happening if I stop therapy? Well, we know that some patient may really have a relapse very, very fast, we call flare, classically happening in the lymph nodes, tumor flare, while other patients may really take longer to really have relapse. So we cannot, it's very, very hard to really um, uh, advise, and it's something that I do not advise, to stop therapy because we don't know how the patient is going to really behave. However, there is no doubt a certain situation where patient may have toxicity, chronic toxicity, yeah. effects, patients may discontinue the drug. Some of these patients, they have been switched to another um, strategy, or some of them decide to say, okay, doctor, leave me alone. I want to recover, and then after that, we'll see if I really want to get in something else, or I want to wait until my disease come back. So, so the, the different strategies. Yeah. All right, one more. It doesn't matter if I miss one dose of oral therapy. Well, there is no doubt that the compliance is always a, a big issue on, on chronic therapies, oral therapies, and we really emphasize the importance to really uh, you know, give these, these drugs right in a daily basis as being prescribed. No doubt that there is two issues here, the financial toxicity, the fact that some patient may really 
um, have a very high copayment, so they may want to skip doses to save money. That's really, really unfortunate, but happened, right? Um, the second one, obviously, is the people who may really have significant side effects of the drug and may not want to retake the drug. So I think these things that need to be discussed with the providers, with doctors, to see how better we can really manage these situations, let's say in intolerance, maybe adjusting the dose, dose reduction. In financial toxicity, it's, it's a challenge, right? We try to help our patient, multiple foundation, leukemia, lymphoma, many other, but, but but I have to really say, sometimes this may not happen. So this is one of the big frustration in, in some patients and, and doctors when we really encounter this, this situation. It really uh, stresses the importance of a doctor-patient relationship. Absolutely, absolutely. But once again, I think um, we always discuss about compliance. I think compliance is a very, very important part of the success of any therapy. So I think we definitely uh, you know, support the fact that patients should really take the drug as prescribed. Totally. Uh, what else do you hear from patients? Anything that you hear that you feel like you have to uh, bust some myths about when you're talking with your patients? Well, um, as you can imagine, in the during the, the phase of active surveillance, and because patients really quite scared, they, they're looking for any alternative uh, medications or even therapies that they are out there who they think they're going to save their lives, right? Mm-hmm. And although I quite uh, liberal of things, we always really uh, pay attention to some of these things that are likely to really have any, any effect and sometimes may be deleterious for, for the health of patients. So I always really make them aware that there's very, very few things that have been tested and there is no much evidence that any of the alternative medicines that we are really out there can have any influence. Everyone referred to the green tea extracts as something that has been described in the literature, even cocarmin. So these the, the couple of things that we may really, um, you know, give to our patient as a way to, to feel that they are doing something. Because I think it's the frustration of the patient that they, they have to wait, they are in surveillance, but they are not doing nothing. However, my best advice to, to my patient is to really try to really get in a very good and healthy lifestyle, right? To really improve, uh, you know, um, nutrition in the ways that everyone knows, but very few people does. Uh, exercise is possible and try to really keep themselves as healthy as possible because we know that there's other, other things that can happen, for example, infections and other things that also may really, really uh, complicate the, the, is the active surveillance strategies that we really uh, recommend. Right, right. Uh, what about clinical trials? Do you hear misconceptions from your patients around enrolling in clinical trials? For sure, for sure, is uh, is very very classical. People um, always, of oh, many patients, unfortunately, they think a clinical trial is an experimental drug that has never been proven in, in patients. And and although it could be true, uh, most of the time they are drug who has a very very important uh, you know background. They have an important uh, you know. Um, scientific evidence why we try them is through the phase one trials. They really are tested for toxicity. Phase two trials is for uh, somewhat efficacy. However, I think we need to discuss a specific basis what kind of a trial. Another mm, important misconception is most of the people think that they're going to really get placebo, the famous placebo versus drug. It's very rare to see placebo um, you know, trials in oncology, right? Most of the patients, when they've been randomized, is another kind of bad word for patients. Oh, I've been, I'm going to be randomized in the placebo. Well, number one, placebo arm is very rare. And most of the time, the, the randomization is a standard of care versus something that we believe that is going to improve the standard of care. Let's say ibrutinib in comparison with ibrutinib plus something else. Let's talk a little bit about side effects. You mentioned before that sometimes it's hard to get patients to comply long-term with treatment. What kind of things are they dealing with? There is many, many side effects in completely different depending on the drugs, right? So every drug, as you can imagine, has different side effects. Obviously, the, the side effects that we discuss in these days are the one in relation to the patient who really have chronic therapies, right? So we're talking about the BTK inhibitors, specific ibrutinib. We now, some of these patients may have really um, a continuous bruising or really even uh, rashes in the skin. Uh, diarrhea may happen in the beginning, may not happen, but some patients may have a continuous in a low grade. They, for example, may have issues with blood pressure. 
may have multiple issues that uh, fatigue, uh, joint uh, pains, uh, bone pains, uh, polyarticular arthralgias. So all these things that some of them they are acute, obviously we're talking about arrhythmias of the heart, the atrial fibrillation, that may need to be taken care of by cardiology consultation. However, there's another thing that they are annoyance that we discuss, right? Annoyance that in the long run may really affect quality of life of our patient. And obviously it's important to really have a really good and honest conversation with between patient and, and, and doctors to see how we can really uh, provide these. Uh, mention dose reduction, or even switching drugs sometimes is also appropriate in situations where we cannot really fix the problem with dose reduction. Um, okay, here's another factor fiction game we can play about side effects. Uh, there is nothing that can be done for my side effects, and we kind of talked about this. Uh, what about fatigue? What can I do about my fatigue? That, that's really a, a problem, a problematic one. I think one of the things that I discuss with my patients sometimes, in patients and older population of patients with other comorbid conditions, sometimes, and I don't say that always, fatigue can really be uh, produced by multiple things. So we always also emphasize the fact that they need to be seen by a primary physician to make sure there is no other issues contributing to fatigue. Classically in diabetic patients, something in, in another patients with other cardiac conditions, right? However, the, the truth is that fatigue is one of the main issues in CLL, sometimes happening before therapy or after therapy with or without uh, current uh, continuous therapy. So maybe fatigue is one of the big ones and is one of the ones that we really, really um, hear from our patient very, very often. We may really, as mentioned before, trying to do adjustment of the doses, but in terms of uh, management, that I will say is, is a challenging one. It's a tricky one, sure. Uh, how about this one? There's an increased risk of secondary cancer and skin cancer from chemo. Well, uh, secondary cancer is um, something that we see very commonly in patients with CLL. So CLL by itself with no therapy can really predispose patients to have high incidence of secondary cancer. That we know this for a long time. How chemotherapy or even the new strategies as, as BTK inhibitors, immuno, um, monoclonal antibodies, or even, can really change that? We don't know. What we know is our patient live longer with our, these uh, new strategies. So the question is, one of the hypotheses could be that those patients, because they live longer, they have more chances to develop cancer. The skin cancer is extremely common in CLL patients, very, wow. very common. And always the argument is that, well, maybe the immunosuppression due to the leukemia condition may predispose to that. The question is how drugs would really eradicate or control the disease can affect this incident. That, that's something that we, we don't know. There's some, some anecdotal evidence that some patients after getting certain therapies may really have more of this skin cancer. Other patients do better. It, it still is hard to really uh, generalize. Sure. Uh, this one kind of gets back to the doctor-patient relationship. I shouldn't bother my team with side effects. Well, uh, obviously, this is the reason we follow patients. We follow patients on uh, a regular basis to really see how they are doing, what kind of side effects they have, what they are doing. I was mentioned that with fatigue may not do much. Some cases with the patient has with uh, arthritic inflammation of the joints that we have seen, well, steroids may, for sure, period of time may work. Obviously, on the pains, we still can really prescribe some, um, you know, Tylenol or things that can really improve the pain. Uh, for the diarrhea, many things to do. For the cramps, for example, also we CoQ10, a calcium supplement. So it's always things that we can really introduce, obviously, for the nausea, uh, something easily to, to treat. So I think the best thing is to really have this uh, regular visit with the doctor and discuss I always really tell my patients to really write in a piece of paper the things I need to ask because many, many times with the rush of the clinics, patients really forget about the more important thing, what they're coming for. Well, we've talked about a lot of treatment and side effects and myths. As an informed patient, I may want to go out onto the internet and find out all I can about CLL. What should I be looking for? What should I be careful about when it comes to online awareness and health literacy? Very, very important topic that I love to really discuss with my patient. I always say that some patients 
kind of intoxicate themselves with multiple uh, websites and with different backgrounds. I think we, I do recommend them to really uh, go to the websites, to the websites who really provide a very fair and really clean and important information. And we definitely, we're discussing about Leukemia Lymphoma Society, uh, CLL Society, Patient Power, really um, National Cancer Institute, uh, you know, website, places that they have very well uh, filtered the information that we can really give to the patient. Uh, there is no doubt there's many others that are not in this list, but I think we always have to be aware that there is other websites that may not really provide really, really a, a, a good information or may may really confuse our patients. So I like you always to really go to, to the sources that I really trust the most. Yeah, so reputable sources and always checking with your doctor, obviously, about things absolutely, that you're considering. Absolutely, I always tell to my patient, you go there, you look at that, you read, but then after that you have a question, come, because sometimes you may have misconceptions. Uh, cancer treatment is always progressing. How hopeful are you about future treatments for CLL? Oh, very, very much. And I think we have been seeing a tremendous, uh, you know, progress in the last uh, 10 years. And I think we're going to continue to to go in this direction. I think there's many more drugs that are coming and down and they're in the pipeline, they're in the clinical trials. Even we have drugs for uh, patients who has resistance, um, you know, BTK mutations. Um, maybe in the future, we're going to see with people who really fail BCL2 inhibitors in a different ways. I think uh, CAR T cell technologies, CAR T cell therapies, also they are coming to CLL, to more advanced phases, to people who already failed multiple lines of new therapies. So I'm quite very, very helpful about how the future really comes in terms of uh, new therapeutic opportunities for our patients with CLL. Dr. Javier Pena, so great to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our partners. To learn more about CLL and access tools to help you become a proactive patient, visit www.powerfulpatients.org. That's one word, powerfulpatients.org. Mm -hmm.